just so viewers who are who are tuning into Salesforce and haven't seen the amazing story that um, we heard about Data Cloud itself, explain the the triad of for Salesforce the AI platform, the Data Cloud platform, and then integration and automation use cases they're meant to support and how they fit together. Give us the gist, and then we'll drill in. Absolutely, George. So first of all, you know, in this day and age, you users, companies expect every application to be intelligent and that intelligence comes from AI, the ability to make insightful predictions based on what the user or the company is trying to do. Um, and AI has got such wonderful capability today from predictive to generative. It's not new to Salesforce. In fact, Salesforce has been doing predictive AI for almost 10 years now. But what is great is that generative AI now gives the ability to process these large language models on large amounts of unstructured, semi-structured content to, to generate really, really great content that can be used by salespeople to send relevant emails by marketing people to create personalized landing pages. Now, for these these, this AI to really be meaningful and for companies to harness the full value of AI, you want to make sure that you're grounding the data that's being used to generate those predictions uh, with some things that are relevant to the current business process, to the current transaction, to the current you know uh, context of interaction you're happening with the customer. And that's where data cloud comes in. The data cloud can take a foundation model that's built on generic information and ground it with the relevant information that contextual to that company, contextual to that business process, so that you can make much more fruitful prediction for the customer, grounded with their data, grounded in that interaction. Now, the second part of, of, of that is the data cloud. But you know, when we talk to our our, our, you know, our large customers, when you ask them, how's that going? You know, they'll all tell us that AI is really important for them. That is something that they want to drive. But they're also saying that the ability, the data for them is spread out across the enterprise. Some of them tell us that they have more than 900 different business systems in which data is stored. And they say that the ability to bring that data together in a seamless way so it can be processed by AI through data cloud is what is standing in the way for getting that work done. So that's where the third pillar comes us, integration and automation, which is the ability to bring all that data together so that it can be processed in data cloud and AI can leverage meaningful insights from that. And then once you do get those insights and predictions, leveraging automation to be able to go take action on that prediction, because you 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 know you're all of a sudden you're you're making real time predictions on you know, shopping cart abandonment, or, you know, how are you going to respond to a customer based on the personalized landing page interaction that they did? You want to take these real-time actions and automation gives business users the ability to decide how to take that action based on a low code way that doesn't require them to build anything with, with IT or write any code. Uh, that's where these three things come together, you know, automation integration to power data cloud, data cloud to bring all the data together so that AI can make those predictions um, meaningful for companies. All right, that was a great setup. And and we didn't even rehearse it. Um, so so let me let me drill into the first the integration piece, then the automation piece. So like our viewers are, are familiar with the the principle of the data cloud because it's abstracting the modern data stack and adding a metadata layer on it, which makes all the sort of ingest, harmonize, unify into a low code, no code sort of way, since it's all metadata driven, borrowing the customer profile uh, model from the operational app and an engagement data model that's added to it. So my question then is, for customers who've grown up on the modern data stack and are familiar with Fivetran as a way to get data out of uh, legacy applications and databases, what do the MuleSoft um, connectors, if that's the right word, um, provide that's analogous and then perhaps um, differentiated? Yeah. So, you know, when we when we talk to our customers, they're essentially telling us that data is spread across the enterprise and then they want the data in real time 
to be available to customers. So think of those examples where, you know, I've got a shopping cart interaction happening and I see a shopping cart abandonment, uh, you know, thing that I want a real time trigger streamed into data cloud so that I can take action on that in real time and give this customer a, a coupon or an offer so that they continue to stay engaged with us in shopping cart and maybe, you know, finish uh, that capability then there. Um, with with MuleSoft and Salesforce integration capabilities, what we've done is we've really focused on the real-time nature of making sure that you can take real-time business transaction in the context of the process that is happening. And that's really what's differentiated in our approach to making sure that we can collect the data in real time and make uh, actions happen in real time. So super low latency, not just from the Salesforce applications, but from other applications. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've we've always taken an API first approach to driving business transformation, driving digital transformation. And that API first approach is based on a real time transaction throughput. And we've built a, you know, a, 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 a an integration stack that's focused on helping very large companies. In fact, there's a you know very large bank in 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 US that processes every single credit card transaction that goes through a, you know this this integration platform. We've got a very large uh, uh, North American Airlines that has built their entire customer experience from booking into the you know uh, booking an airline ticket to checking into your flight to ordering um, you know special meals for your flight. All of that on an API-based platform that's built on this, and we're able to process that scale of transactions. Now, as you get into AI, all of that are extremely relevant to be able to drive those real-time throughput, and that's where um, you know our, our our customers are finding value in 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 our technology. So let's let's break that out into those apps. The, the, the scenario you just talked about with the airline, which parts are applications outside of Salesforce? operational apps outside Salesforce, which parts are native to Salesforce, and then explain how the the integration and the automation components bring that bring all of those pieces together. Yeah, it's a really great question. So for example, you know, we we think of the a, a composable API led architecture as as a three layered API, right? There is a uh, an API, we call that experience API. That experience API is used to drive the experience that you're going to deliver to, you know, either employees or consumers on a website. Now, you know, in the case of their airlines, many of their experiences are not built in Salesforce. They were built in, in, in a classic website or a mobile application that's delivered to, to the consumers. And yet many of those are, are built um, using Salesforce to be able to drive the customer satisfaction and loyalty points and all of that. In the case of uh, this customer, it doesn't matter where the end experience is built. And in fact, they continue to redesign and reimagine some of these experiences because they're all built on a, an experience API that's powered by MuleSoft. Now, when I said three-layer API, beneath that experience API is the, the process API and the raw API. So you can look at, for example, your loyalty management system today has an experience API that gets used by both consumers and 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 employees that are managing you know transactions with customers and they're powering different interfaces and experiences for them. But over time, you might decide to you know acquire another loyalty system or start to redeem loyalty points and another partner. All of that can happen without having to sacrifice the experience you're delivering to the customers because all of them gets built using this three-layered API interface where the experience API doesn't change, but the process API or the raw API that powers those experience API continues to change. So I'm, I know I'm getting a little bit into, into the weeds here, but I kind of wanted to explain the architecture where we built this you know, three-layered API architecture that that's helped our customers, in this case, drive digital transformation because they're able to say, we can now reimagine the experiences we're giving to our consumers and customers without having to worry about how we are reimagining our different systems and rationalizing the different applications that we have in supporting these experiences because we are, you know, 
loosely coupling all of these through a, a an API based approach, and that gives us the flexibility to you know to design these things irrespective of the you know the core underlying application of the experiences that we're delivering. And this is what's been been really really beneficial for us um, to drive both digital transformation and now AI led transformation for our customers. All right, this is fascinating because what I took away from that is. In the and I'm translating this into to our viewers who probably grew up in the modern data stack world, where they ingest data. There's you know the the raw data, then they have the normalized tables, and then the the end products, the denormalized gold you know gold uh, data products. And what I'm hearing from you is that you've created an abstraction above the raw um, legacy application APIs that it corresponds to a business process, in this case, an experience API. And that allows you to plug in multiple lower level process APIs, sort of like in the modern data stack, you might have the experience as the gold uh, data product. And then these are the normalized, the process APIs are the normalized products corresponding to other applications. But what you've provided in your connectivity, it's not just an adapter to a legacy app, you're providing and a business process abstraction that absolutely. others can plug it into. I well said, absolutely. And and that abstraction is built on a, a, a layered, you know, API based approach that gives you the flexibility to transform, you know, your business at the speed at which you're ready to drive the transformation, whether it's a, a transformation experience you're providing to, to customers or whether it's transformation of underlying operating layer that's that's driving the business by providing this this layer of abstraction between the experience and the the underlying platform that's servicing the transactions you can sort of you know work on those independently okay so let me ask help enumerate some examples for the business process um, abstraction layers like like the experience layer what other processes have you abstracted where you have um, application uh, workflow processes underneath where you could plug in different apps. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of our customers use us for business processes across that enterprise. You know, we have uh, customers, you know, that use us for transforming their, you know, and the way they, they, they manage their suppliers and the supply chain processes. Um, you know, we have customers that use us across, you know, in, in the case of this large, you know, bank that I was talking about around uh, processing of, of, of credit card transactions. Um, we have customers that are using this to, to help drive transformations around customer experience and which is where I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of our technology gets used because that's where m most of our conversations are with our customers around, around consumer and customer experience. Um, and in and, and customer experience, you know, if you look at the, the processes, um, you know, recently we had a customer that was able to drive down their uh, abandonment rates of chat. Um, they basically opened a, a, a consumer chat with, with customers and they noticed that the abandonment, abandonment rate of the chat was really high because they, yeah, the, 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 the chat agents weren't able to process a lot of things that customers wanted to be able to do. And by plugging it, the ability to drive more actions through integration and automation, they were able to reduce their chat abandonment, abandonment rates by, by 80%. Um, that's an example of, of what our customers have been able to do. You know, I, the, the, the example around, you know, driving digital transformation on airlines expensive, but we had another customer that, um, you know, in this case, an automotive OEM um, that said that, you know, our business is changing largely from, you um, building cars to creating an experience for drivers when they're inside the car, right? We were largely a manufacturing company. That's what people called us. And now we're becoming more of a, an experience for the driver. And, you know, putting technology into our cars is extremely important, but we also want to manage the experience when the driver is not in the car. We want to give them a mobile application. We want to give them a web page in which they can kind of see where they can charge their car when they're on their trip and they can plan all their trips. And they wanted to create this experience um, that they can drive on a dashboard in a car, a mobile app on a uh, on a you know on a mobile device, and then on a, on a web browser as well, where they can see all the interaction. And and they were changing 
the business model as they were doing it, they were going away from selling through dealers to going direct to consumers and being able to interact and, and build a, a relationship with the consumer a slash driver that was driving their car. And they said, for us to do all of that, we have to think of everything as a, you know, as, as not as we're going to change the guts of how we run our business from, from an IT perspective, but building a layer of APIs that can help drive this experience to our, to our cons- drivers or cons- customers and be able to change those operating, operating uh, you know, s- systems and things that we're using over time to be able to drive those, those kinds of things. Um, so so that- be yeah. fair, fair to say that then this experience layer is an evergreen API that you're always enriching and extending to more potential customer touch points and more activities within those touch points. Absolutely. It's a really great way to take it. You know, experience layer is, is, is essentially you, you, you know, create the strategy first, you build this experience layer, and then you start building your experiences on, 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 on top of that. And that helps drive, you know, the, the applications um, that, that you're building. Um, you know, I, you go ahead. Well, let me just then clarify so that underneath that, so that gives developers a chance to, to build rich experiences without having to get lost in the, in the sort of particulars of how each application implements its piece of it. So, um, so you're, you're building the experience abstraction and always extending it. Then, um, customers can plug in their, their individual applications, um, through this process layer underneath, which it sounds like you're you're hiding but then can you hide when when a customer wants to um essentially um orchestrate activity that would require data or transactions from multiple underlying applications can you abstract the transaction semantics you know the the errors and the retries and the compensation from them as long as it it fits within the guardrails of that experience api Absolutely. And that's that's how we define so the experience API to be. It's experience API is abstracted or built on top of process APIs, which is built on top of raw API. So think of an experience API as a customer information, you know, get my customer data. The customer data in, in most companies sits in multiple systems. And, and usually there's different raw APIs for each one of those systems to get the, the financial profile of the customer from the ERP system, get the, 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 the real customer you know, communications profile from the CRM system and, and other systems in which you know, the data about the customers might be stored. So there's raw APIs for each one of these systems. On top of that, you create a, a process API that consolidates a lot of this data over time. And then on top of that, you create the, the experience API to make sure that you can consolidate data across this thing. So when we design, you know, these different layers of APIs, you you decide, you know, at what layer you want to abstract what information. Um, and and sometimes, you know, you don't need three layers. Sometimes you just need two layers, and that's fine as well. But gen, you know, our our point of view is is three systems. Then I also want to mention one other thing, which is. A lot of our customers do this outside of the confines of like their own custom application. But when our customers are using Salesforce, for example, ASICS, the street company that uses Salesforce's e-commerce application, and they were able to, you know, an an e-commerce system provides this experience to customers, but the inventory application sits in multiple inventory systems for them. And they were able to, you know, using integration systems, be able to drive increased revenue by consolidating a better experience across inventory availability and fulfillment. Um, and they got 16% increase in, in revenue through that. So we have customers that are actually finding value on top of the the, the applications that that are used by by Salesforce and provided natively out of Salesforce as well. So let's, let's say a, a customer had Salesforce and for some reason they were using Shopify and NetSuite as well. And within that, um, that experience, they wanted to create like a, a customer experience where um, you're 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 calling on data to find out like who's a high priority customer and you're going to promise a delivery date and all that requires let's just say somehow updating data across the three apps. Now, can you make that? Can you abstract that from the developer so that 
it's they're working only in the experience API and you take care of the transactions across the other three. Absolutely. You know, if it, when you talk to developers that are building these integration systems, usually they don't understand the domain of the edge system that they have to work with. Uh, if you expect the developer to understand NetSuite and also understand, you know, the inventory management or, or tracking application and also the, you know, the custom e-commerce application, it is a huge drag on their productivity. However, if you create an enterprise architecture that says, you know, we've created this API that tells you that this is how you get all the inventory information. And then the, the developers that know each one of these systems actually create raw APIs that can be consumed by this experience API, then you, you've, you've dramatically increased the productivity of the developers that are working on it. And not only that, what we also do is we also, through automation, we also give you local tools to be able to stitch together these automations um, because you can abstract these APIs into connectors as well, which can be used in, in low-code ways to be able to drag and drop and do simple operations that a business analyst can do that doesn't require any, any development skills. So just to be clear, um, is it that there are some professional developers within the customer organization who are dealing at the lowest level API, the raw API, who are essentially writing the transaction transaction logic that then gets consumed by, let's say, a, a more uh, casual or uh, corporate, corporate type developer, um, maybe a citizen developer at the experience API level. Is that how it works? That's that's that definitely one case, right? You can see they, you know, depending on the sophistication of the integrated process that you are building, you can say that you could have a an API, a, a in, in in this case we call connector, which basically abstracts away the you know how the authentication happens against that API and all of that, be exposed in a low code environment tool that a business analyst can do. So you know an example of that is you know I want to take my opportunity is closed in Salesforce and I want to take that opportunity data and I want to push it into my ERP system into an order so that the order can get, get provision and fulfill. Now, this is a, a simple transformation of you know some data from opportunity into an order data in here. And if you can give the business analyst the tools to be able to connect these things that they can very easily do it using a, using a connector. Uh, and if you are, you know, looking at the, the order to cash process and, and you want to look at all variants of wit in which the, the order came in and how it gets fulfilled and manage all the exceptions and manage all the intricacies of how the inventory gets fulfilled or not and how long the order sits and how do they get prioritized, that may be a more complex experience that a, a business analyst wouldn't be able to do. But with the let, set of APIs that are available, you can give it to a you know, professional developer or integration developer that can go ahead and create that end-to-end -end process. Okay, and and just to be clear now, there's a workflow model that's in like the low-code tool, which I, I believe you call uh, Composer. And um, the workflow model is shared with the operational app, Salesforce operational apps, and then it's metadata driven. So like walk us through a scenario where like, you're simplifying for for a corporate developer what they would have had to do by going you know directly to the APIs and understanding transaction semantics there, workflow semantics, how it's all now wrapped up in some sort of essentially in a, in a no code low code interface. Yeah, so we we look at sort of the 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 low code no code um, you know set of tool sets in a in a number of ways. One is you have simple connectors in which you want to call to, you know, stitch together different systems and they have connectors. Um, the connectors are essentially wrapped API calls that are simplified for consumption by a business analyst. So things like I want to, you know, create an order. I want to query a customer. I want to, and, you know, I want to, and these could be in, in whatever commonly used systems that are, that are used in the enterprise and we ship those connectors out of the box that can be used by user and composer by dragging and dropping these things and connecting them together. We also have the ability to, in, in, in the same environment, also be able to call an RPA process. You know, for systems in which like the APIs are don't exist, are very hard to uncover, and you can create those connectors easily, but you know how to get to it through a user interface, 
you can build an RPA bot and then you can take that RPA bot and you can consume it in the same interface. So you can stitch together, you know, I create a customer record from Salesforce uh, and then I grab some customer information from this mainframe application that didn't have an API. So I got a bot to, to go do it for me. And then I want to take that customer information along with that, you know, transaction that the customer is trying to perform and push it to another system that may have an API or through an RPA process. What we're really excited about is, um, you know, announcing this month the release of intelligent document processing, uh, which is also a low code capability in, in the same interface. What that does is gives our customers the ability to say, when you have a business process that has initiated from a document by reading information from a document, whether the document is an invoice or an order form or a ID document or a pay stub or whatever the type of document is. As long as it is structured or semi-structured um, and there is certain information on as a human eye can recognize what type of document it is and extract information from it, we can use that document and, and use it in the context of that business process. So you can take and combine your, your connectors Using local tools in Composer, you can take your RPA capabilities to connect to systems that don't have APIs or connectors, or you can use intelligent document processing to be able to extract information from documents. All of that done in a low-code way to automate more and more processes within the enterprise without having to write any code, just drag and drop things that business analysts can do. Okay. So, in other words, you when you put all the pieces together, the, the AI platform, integration automation, data cloud, you've really up-leveled the modern data stack so that we're no longer talking about just like a query engine or data processing pipeline. And we're really looking at something that's it's becoming an application platform. Um, tell us maybe elaborate on, on some scenarios that become possible when we think of... Um, when we can think of transactions that essentially um, activate data in multiple applications, help us think through more examples there where, you know, operational apps no longer live just in the legacy silos, but you've got a new platform that spans all those silos because of all the pieces you've put together. Yeah. So uh, first, uh, I'd say, you know, a couple of things I, I'd say before I kind of dive into scenarios and tell about what's, what we're seeing some of our customers do. One is that we're seeing an explosion of APIs happening in the enterprise. More and more companies are saying, well, we want to expose the API for whatever we're building first and then start to build experiences on top of that. So we provide an ability to say, well, those once those APIs are available, can we you know, manage them? Can we, you know, catalog them? Can we govern those APIs through, you know, capabilities around API management and, 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 and be able to use them or reuse them across the different, different things that you're, you're creating across the enterprise. One of the primary use cases, you know, that we've seen for customers getting excited about these APIs is the, the use cases in, in AI. So we've got a customer, for example, that basically is saying, I am going through a transformation process in finance. And as part of that transformation process in finance, I want to use an LLM that's available, you know, by outside of my firewall that can help me drive some of my transformation process in finance. But I'm very concerned about you know what information is leaving my you know corporate boundary to to go to this LLM and and you know is 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 the result coming back is is there hallucination in it can I detect how many times this API is being called so we have customers that are basically saying just like they can use API management tools to manage an internal API that's happening within the system they can now use the, the LLM APIs to be managed as well to create a, you know, a gateway for LLM gateway that can be used for not just customer centric transformation, customer process transformation, but transformations that happen outside of what customers are doing. Now, of course, if you're using 
Einstein LLM, that is something that's natively provided. We manage all that LLM, but we're seeing that the tools that we provide there are also you know, used by our customers to drive transformations in each cases out, outside of that. In this particular case, um, in another example of the customer is that they, they wanted to create a, a scenario around uh, internal uh, employee help for internal systems and getting internal work done using a, a chatbot interface, and in this case, in Slack. And they wanted to basically make sure that the power of all the AI that's available across the different systems is in terms of the, the APIs that are available are available to those customers. So through something that we just released, which is, you know, Copilot, we were able to take all of the all of the APIs that are available within the application, within the, sorry, within the enterprise and be able to use that as Copilot action so that you can say that when you're doing that transaction, I'm, I'm within that interface, uh, you know, conversational interface, they're able to go reach out to a system to do a, a credit memo to a customer that you know is, is experiencing bad you know outcome for for whatever reason, or being able to you know query inventory information for a certain product that sits in some ERP system someplace by just doing the conversation and being able to reserve that inventory against you know a, a future order that that is about to be placed. Um, so you can do those kinds of things you know, with conversational experiences today, because the wealth of what API is available can be exposed as, uh, as a copilot action so that copilots are much more powerful. Okay. This is, this is great. So what you're describing essentially is giving copilots additional skills in terms of actions. Um, and then all the data in data cloud as context, um, that's the additional knowledge. And then I assume, um, the workflow model that's in Composer is is sort of the the abstraction for sort of how do you do a sequence of activities. And I imagine the only thing that I that's either missing or or that I don't know about would be some way of putting guardrails around a specific workflow task to say it can access only these skills and this knowledge. Yeah, and that's what uh, we're able to do with by defining policies on top of the APIs that are governed by that. So you can do those policies very specifically that gives us authorization right to see who is able to access the API. But we can also do rate limiting. You can also do you know protect against abuse of that API. So you can say this API can only be called X number of times within a minute, within an hour, whatever that is. Or if you see that this API gets called a lot by certain user or certain sets of users in, in, in an organization, you can, you know, limit their consumption as well. So all of those can be managed through the a policy management tool that we provide on top of the API lifecycle. Okay. So there's, I mean, the, putting the three legs of your, your triad together again, you know, the, the data cloud integration automation and the AI platform, this is, this is pretty powerful. What's, what's going on here. Um, I, I guess, you know, just blue skying it a little bit. One scenario I could think of, and I don't know if this is sort of on the drawing boards, is what you're what you're describing now with the workflow enablement and the and the actions and the data is hinting towards you know agents. They don't have to be autonomous, but they can be like weekly supervised. And and where can we go with that? And then where might we go at some point where agents can call on other agents that are specialized for different activities? What might that look like? Some scenarios, if that's realistic. Yeah, no, there's a lot of excitement around, uh, you know, around this whole concept of agents talking to agents without even having a human in a loop. Um, what we have seen so far is, is in, in terms of use cases, what our customers are doing is autonomous is almost there, but not quite. Uh, you know, it, it is a lot of like, you know, driving the, the, a, a, a co-pilot type interface where you are guiding a, you know, a, a user to do certain actions, whether it's a code gen in a code builder tool, or whether it's generating content so that the user can kind of read it, review it and publish it. Uh, I think we're maybe, you know, my guess is maybe six months away from getting to a place where we'll see autonomous execution of agents uh, at, at, a, at a high scale. Now we've seen some autonomous agents like in, in, sim, in simpler 
sort of customer service interactions and others, but looking at an autonomous BDR, for example, right, or looking at, you know, the ability to generate um, code and create and publish code that only gets reviewed by uh, a, a an engineer or senior engineer. Um, I think we're about six, maybe six to six years to one year, six months to one year away in, in, in that thing. But it is very exciting where this technology is headed. All right. I think on that note, we should wind down. Param, any last thoughts that that you want to leave our viewers with about the, the, this awesome triad? And I'm, I'm not referring to the nuclear triad, but it's the quasi-nuclear triad that you guys have built. No, it's it's really exciting, you know, what is what our businesses and what the customers are able to achieve with the technology today. Um, you know, I, I always, uh, you know, tell my team, my customers that the the impact that enterprise software is going to have on businesses in the over the next five years is more than the impact that enterprise software has has maybe had in the history of its existence. You know, the last 40, 50 years. Uh, I think we are going to see such a high rate of of adoption and growth and transformation in the enterprise, especially enterprises which have typically where systems have actually got into the way of people's ability to get work done. We will see that completely change where you'll get to a place where if you didn't have the system, people are going to feel half as productive, um, not twice as productive as the case is sometimes today. All right, Param, on that note, thanks for joining us. And um, hopefully this is the first of many conversations. Thank you so much, George, for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation.